Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. This episode brought to you by My Cat Callie. Episode 179, App Clips in React Native with Janique and Dupussy. Hey everyone, welcome to React Native Radio Podcast, where we explore React Native together. I'm your host, Jamin Holmgren. I'm joined, as always, by my three co-hosts. Hey, Harris. How's it going today? Hey, Jamin. It's going good. Thanks for asking. Good, good. Uh, Is it getting cold up in Montreal yet? Yeah, it's actually starting to get pretty chilly here, so... It started actually this morning. It was it was kind of like frosty around here. What about you, Aditi? How's uh, how's the Midwest? Uh, it started to get cold again. Yeah, it definitely feels like fall now, so it's gonna start dipping. It feels like it just all of a sudden turned a corner. Like oh, it was the twenty first. Now it's the twenty second. It's time to get cold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right around Halloween, it's gonna be really cold here. I think they've been predicting snow next week here. Oh really? Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, we're a remote podcast, so I don't think you can call in that you can't get into the <laughs> podcast recording. <laughs> no, I'd love to keep joining. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, Robin, how are you doing? Uh, you, uh, you're you closer to me, so I assume you're seeing the same weather. Yes, I'm in the same climate as you, and it did frost last night. We're going to have to winterize our hoses. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Well, consider this is your reminder. <laughs> I Here, I'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, and our awesome guest today is a guy that actually lives not very far from Harris uh, up in Montreal, Janique Duplessis. Did I say that correctly, Janique? Yeah, that's close enough. <laughs> close enough. <laughs> Can you say it for people so that we, we get the right yeah, pronunciation? Sure. Uh, with my best French Canadian accent, it would be Janique Duplessis. Okay, yeah, I I really didn't hit that, but you know we'll we'll pretend like I did. Uh, really awesome to have you on today. He, uh, Janique is the co-founder and lead developer of Third Wave, a website and app to find cafes and order coffee. I think it's up mostly in your area right now. It's kind of a startup. Yeah, yeah, um, we're mostly in like Montreal and Canada right now. Um, okay, slowly expanding. Like it's a local app, so like we're going city by city, and right now we're well established in Montreal. Uh, and looking to expand like to the rest of the, of Canada and then eventually the U.S. So, right in, in a Very city cool. near you soon. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, Harris was telling us before the show that that your app is a great way to find good neighborhoods because if there's a third wave cafe in the area that means it's a good neighborhood is that right Harris? well yeah it was more for uh like if you're trying to buy real estate i don't know how accurate this is but i would say that <laughs> if you have a third way coffee in a neighborhood and people are buying five dollar latte then that's a good sign it's gonna appreciate <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh janique is also a core contributor to react native for over four years now and the developer of the very popular although i think people probably don't think about it all that often react native safe area context so we're going to be talking with him about that. But one of the big things we're going to be talking about is uh, iOS app clips. And that's going to be a fun topic when we get there. But before we do that, uh, Janik, can you tell us a bit about yourself? You know, where you grew up? How'd you get into coding? You know, how'd you get into open source? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I've always uh, lived in Montreal, Canada, up there in the north. Um, I... I just I was always interested in like computer video games and stuff as a kid, so I was like I kind of want to do that for work later. I ended up studying uh, computer science in like uh, here it's called CIGEP. It's like it's like before university. It's like a, this weird thing we have only in Quebec. So yeah, I, then after that I started working uh, for a company that does um, software for uh, CIGEPs kind of <laughs> it's kind of funny like I, I i worked for a company that pretty much did all the software like all the like email stuff pretty much all the like online class stuff that there is now with covid we, we had some of it uh there like where you could like end in homeworks and stuff like this uh, chat with your your co- like your teammates um so yeah that's how i got into app development uh, in my with my internship there, and then I worked there uh, also part time while going to university. It, it was nice. Like I, it was um, 
it's funny because I kind of got it's how I got into like um, building infrastructure for for apps. So like React Native, right? You use React Native to build apps. But there, I was working on like their in-house like web view based uh, framework mm -hmm. um, for for the mobile app because the mobile app was just like a a web view basically and i was the one that was working with like both ios and android to like add the kind of bridging code to access mm -hmm. the native feature from the web view so like you, you you'd think of like cordova and all this stuff like we had like a right. kind of our in-house uh thing like that so that's how i i got into like yeah. native development a little bit also because like i never did yeah. like in school we i I'd, I'd learned like c sharp and like uh, a little bit of javascript so um right. Working there, I learned like JavaScript properly because it was like a JS app. It also, it's like it was this 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 place where like everything was done in house. So they had their own JS framework. They had <laughs> their own like we wouldn't use like React or like anything, right? It was just like right. everything was like written. There was like almost no dependencies or whatever. There's some value in in doing that sometimes, uh, even though usually it's not especially you know um, efficient. <laughs> yeah, I mean. For me, for me, it was nice because I got to work on on this kind of lower level like uh, mm -hmm. tooling stuff. But starting from scratch, I probably just use React though. <laughs> but it was it was interesting for me at least like out from school and just like I was just starting off like my career, I guess. So yeah, I got I got to learn like JavaScript properly, also like a little bit of native for like Objective C on iOS and also um, Java and Android. So that actually, that was like a really, really good foundation for working on React Native later. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's a very similar problem. So how did you, if you were kind of, you were kind of uh, doing a lot of your own stuff and not really using open source as much, how did you go from that to being a, an open source contributor? Yeah, so basically, um, after two years, I started a consulting company with one of my friends. App and Flit actually still exists. Um, I don't know, you know, I think you know Charles, right? Charles Vinet from App and Flow. I don't, I know Iris knows him. Yeah, I, I know him. Yeah, actually we just chatted in July. Uh, we have a, a, like a shared channel with, with App and Flow. I didn't actually realize that you were one of the co-founders of App and Flow. That's very cool. He still runs the, the, the agency right now. So I, I started doing that. So when, basically when we got our first contract, we both quit university and, um, or jobs and we're like let's 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 do this like we, we're, we're gonna do our own thing and uh do apps so that's pretty much when actually i started contributing to react native a little bit before like i don't know i, I think i just saw like an article about it coming out when it was released and like i, I wanted to try it actually i oh, i remember yeah so when i was in university um like it had the worst like web web like services and whatever like like the the email client was really bad. Like everything was really bad. Um, so I built an app with React Native to access my emails and my grades. Wow! Wow! So that was like just a little, you know, a personal project for fun. So that's uh, when I saw React Native coming out. I was like, oh, that that'd be a cool project to do. When I was in do you school. remember what version of React Native? Oh, that was like the first, pretty much. Well, I don't remember <laughs> yeah. the, the actual number, but it was like literally when it came out. Like it's like in 2015, I think. I don't even know if it, there was uh, Android support yet, but, or or maybe maybe it was maybe it was when Android came out. I'm not sure, but um, like it, it was just released, and actually that's when I made my first commit to to React Native because like there was a random like, I think there was a crash, but it would crash the whole app instead of like popping up the red screen. So I like I fixed the the. The, the native crash so it wouldn't crash in native it was to like just show the actual error i'm guessing there was a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit back then yeah i mean <laughs> it was to be honest it was so easy like if you wanted to like contribute it was the best time to get to like get into yeah, it yeah i'm saying much easier than it is yeah. now where everything's pretty mm -hmm. pretty solid yeah r right now it's i mean there's still some stuff especially with like the the new like rewrite that are coming out um but yeah back then it was like so new that like pretty much it you, you would find a crash just by using it. And like, I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I always like, um, like if I see something that crashes in my like dependencies or whatever, I'm not gonna just like go, I'm not gonna go file an issue in GitHub. I'm gonna mm. try to find what the crash is and fix it. And then I'm just submitting mm -hmm. a pull request straight away. And that's always how I work and how I like um, pretty much 
did all my most of my work uh, on React Native, I would just like use it for like my own products or projects. And then if I find an issue or I found like a feature that's missing, like sometimes it's just like, you know, there's a new thing. Like actually I noticed something recently. It's uh, there's like a new prop for the date picker on iOS. There's two styles now, but there's no prop to control it right now. Hmm. So it, that, that'd be like a, right now, if, if you want to make a PR to React Native, go add the, the prop to control the style of the date picker and uh, but everyone's going to, going to win. So it all started with your university website being so bad. So thanks to them, you got into React Native. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that can be it. Yeah. I don't know if I would have gotten in it anyways, but yeah, it, it was definitely a cool, like I always, especially like back then when I was still in school and stuff, finding like little projects to do on the side. So um, that's kind of how I got into like open source and using this stuff. Okay, we're going to um, move into our main topic. Before I do that, I'd like to mention that this episode is sponsored by Infinite Red, as always, uh, the the app and, and uh, web consulting company that I am one of the founders of. We do React and React Native work. Uh, of course, if you are interested in, if you're considering doing a React or React Native project, hit us up. You can email me directly, jamin at infinite.red, or just hit our, our main website. You can find a contact form there and missy who is our sales uh coordinator will respond to you i'll i'll see the email as well we're not that big of a company so uh, <laughs> you know you don't have to go through channels to find me uh so you can find us online at infinite.red so our main topic today is ios app clips in react native and janique actually has a very um good perspective on this because he's done some kind of uh, work around that. But before we get into the stuff that you've been doing, what exactly is an app clip? Because it's not something, I'm an iOS user and I don't exactly even know what an app clip is. Yeah, so it's really new. It actually got released with iOS 14. So it's normal that probably most people haven't like used any. Like I haven't neither. Uh, I just saw the, the, the announcement at uh, the mm -hmm. latest Apple conference, the, their dev conference. And I got really excited because the use case is like really good for the kind of stuff that we do at Third Wave. So um, some th they had like examples with Yelp, which is kind of similar in what we do. So what we do is we have like a digital loyalty card program for coffee, for independent coffee shops. So they could have like just like this NFC chip or um, a QR code, and then you can uh, scan it and then it will take you to the app it, w it won't even download the app. It will just like download like a lightweight version of the app. And then it's, it's going to be more similar to like a website, pretty much. It will just download it uh, right away, open it to like their loyalty card page. And then you could like claim your stamp and like start using the the app without having the full full app install. And then they kind of upsell you to like get, get the full app eventually if you like hmm. it. So it's like an in-between between a nat native app and a website. There's also the same thing on Android. I don't remember the the actual name it's, it's, apps. In, yeah i think it's something like this uh i haven't investigated that yet but mm -hmm. it's probably like the next phase i wanted to try it with app clips because usually when like apple does stuff it actually gets traction <laughs> sadly with yeah. sometimes with android they, they do these features and nobody uses them so they, they've they've had instant apps for a while but i haven't like seen uh much use so yeah we're trying out we were trying to roll out like an app clip experience soon I, I actually had a question. Uh, what about like the way you described it, where if someone wants to use their loyalty card right away without downloading the app, like that sounds really cool. But what about authentication? How do you know who they are? Uh, yeah. So it supports like, and like it's it's basically a full app. So it supports all the authentication uh, methods that are normally available. So you could. They, Apple tries to push sign in with Apple, of course. They're like, oh, it works with sign in with Apple. So people could like just tap and create their account with, using Apple sign in. Or you could support your own, like, create, you could create an account through the app. So, yeah. So basically, you would tap, you would get your card, and then you would either sign in uh, through any of our, like, Facebook, okay. Apple, or create your own account. Gotcha. Okay. So you maintain your regular auth flow that you already had. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So um, I think I didn't get the part. Are you saying now this is integrated with React Native? Do we have app clip support there? It's not integrated like 100%. Uh, app clips are actually just regular 
um, iOS apps, but they have restrictions on like size. So maybe I can get more into like details about like uh, the stuff I I had to do to like make it work better. But okay. uh, it's basically it basically it supports it's just a regular UI kit app. So you have like your app delegate, like it's just a regular uh, React Native project would kind of work uh, to be an app clip, but you want to make some additional optimizations usually to like make sure it stays small. And it's also part of another app. So it's like you, in your uh, project, you will have your app target and you also have your app clip target. So, mm, okay. and then you so can- it's like a watch, like a watch OS yeah, app. Exactly. Or a TV OS or something. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And you recently tweeted about this. Uh, I think it was, well, it was a few weeks ago, but you tweeted, uh, working on an app clip with React Native going pretty good so far. Main challenge is refactoring code to allow missing native modules on the clip. And then you kind of go on to describe how you how you kind of worked around that technical uh, limitation. So I assume that it would just crash if it found something that that you had optimized out of there or something along those lines. Yeah, so um, basically in your app clip target, you usually don't want to have all your native dependencies because you're not mm -hmm. like, let's say um, in the main app, I have like Stripe for like payment processing. And in the app clip, I'm, I don't want to use Stripe because I don't need it. So I don't want to include the, the binary for that because like you, you really want to be careful with your app size. So every native dependencies that I wasn't using like, from the main app, I wouldn't include them in the app clip. So some, like a lot of op open source libraries had issues with that because they would like try to access constants and stuff like right away, even if the code wasn't uh, like even if you wouldn't call methods on the the, the module, there would there would still load some code and then crash because it was missing the the native module. So I had to make sure that um, basically the the library would never be loaded unless um, I was in the app clip. Um, so so what I did is like you have for the app clip you will have two different like entry points so you have like your index.js for your main app and then you have like your index app clip uh, .js for the app clip so in in that uh, js file i would like inject mm. all the dependencies mm -hmm. like i kind of implemented some like kind of uh, dependency injection where like okay. i i wouldn't like it would never i would never like require the the, the actual like native module um, mm from the code, they would just like try to get, like I would have a function that's like get uh, stripe. Mm -hmm. And then I would call that. And then at, in, in the index for the the main app, I would inject stripe and in the app clip, I wouldn't. So then I could okay. also check if it was like available or not and then always use that. I see. So your index was sort of loading all of these third party dependencies and then passing it along to any of the subfiles and subfolders that you were using uh, throughout the app, then yeah, that would be basically what it yeah. did. Dependency injection, very cool. Yeah, that, that's it. Was one of the first time where I'm like, oh, that's kind of this thing you can do that's like useful. But sometimes I, I feel like sometimes people will will be like, will they will start with this huge ar architecture? They'll be like, oh yeah, I have dependency injection and all these things. I think I, yeah. I remember the first time hearing about it was like in Angular, where they're pretty big about this. <laughs> I think, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That, that's a pretty good tweet storm uh, that you posted. I really like it. We should probably include it in the show notes. Um, so, like with the app clips, it's kind of a lightweight version of the app, right? So, I was wondering, like, let's say if you have like a, you know, your app needs to be purchased from the app store or there's like kind of a subscription model, how do you handle that when a user just gets the app clip version of it? How do they purchase the app, I guess? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um... To be honest, I don't really know because <laughs> I don't have a, a, um, a purchasable app or whatever. But there, there's, there's like, there's like all of, uh, there's a flow to like upgrade from the app clip to the regular app. So I assume you can get the app clip for free, and then okay. when you want to get the full app, you you get it from the store and like you would normally. So like I think in the app clip there's like a link, and then you'll see like get the full app, and then it will take you to the app store. And then if the app is not free, I assume that's where you would uh, actually pay for the full app. That makes sense. Kind of like a you know preview version is available yeah. for free. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Do app clips show up as icons on your home screen? They don't. They have a spot in the settings where you can, I think you can access all the app clips. I'm not sure. 
Uh, okay. I know you can delete them there. That's because that's when I, what I do when I, I want to like reset my my app clip. Yeah. So th they have a, they have some spots in the settings, but they're not like an actual app, and they don't have an icon on the the mm. sort. They're usually started by an experience, so like by a URL. So oh, I see. Um, either scanning a QR code uh, or a NFC. I actually got NFC uh, tags recently. It's pretty cool. Um, it works really well with. Uh, I think it's only though if you have like an iPhone XS or later, it just <laughs> scans like in the background. So you don't even have to like open like your uh, like scanning app or anything. You just have to like tap your phone near um, a oh, chip cool. when it's unlocked and it just works. It opens the app clip. It's really, really a cool experience. So is that the experience you're going for with third wave? When I go to a coffee shop, there's going to be an NFC um, terminal somewhere and I'll have my loyalty card open up automatically. Yeah, that's like the the um, optimal flow that we want to go for right now. Like, it's not supported. Like, it's only on I that that would only work on like iOS fourteen. And if you have an iPhone XS or later, mm, this flow right. would work. Otherwise, for for more uh, for older phones, you have to go in like your um, control center or something, and then you click on like scan tag, and then you can scan it. Uh, that's mm -hmm. on iOS 14. If you're before iOS 14, it's like really bad. Like I'm not sure what you have to do to scan an NFC chip there. Gotcha. It's the first time I have an iPhone 10, and this is the first time that I'm hearing that my phone is too old to do something. I know, so. right? <laughs> it used to be like the cutting edge of phones, and now it's yeah. old. So app clips are like they are they not full screen apps? Are they just kind of? Oh uh, yeah, they're. They're full screen apps. It's just they are full when I, what okay. I showed you is just the like preview actually because like you have this. Okay. It opens like the app clip preview, and then oh, I see. you click like there's the, if the app clip actually works. I don't know why it's not working right now, but you will see like an open button, and then you can click and it opens the the full app. Mm. Jam install my question again, but I was gonna Did ask I? about uh, how like the visual layout of app clips and like whether you're constrained to like a fixed height. How does like what kind of challenges did that present in like laying things out? Actually, when you open the app clip, it's um, just a regular full screen app, so there's no like restrictions or anything. The the like the screen that you saw, like when you scan the NFC tag, is um, is not customizable at all. Actually, it's not. It's uh, is you all you have all you can send is like when you create your app clip, you can set up experiences on um, App Store Connect. And then you can give a URL and uh, you can s set an image, the title, subtitle, uh, and I think the text on the button. There's a, a few things you can customize. It's actually really bad because you have to customize every URL manually. I don't know if there's an API for it. I haven't like really um, did research on that. But right now, for each uh, URL that I have that I want an app clip on, I have to go into uh, the App Store config thing and then like you can set up like the image and all the configuration oh wow, oh, wow yeah so it's not a, a totally customizable ui like a full app uh the this the card that pops when you scan is not but the rest is yeah okay hmm. i was gonna ask about like the navigation within an app clip can is there like a restriction on the number of screens you can have or is, because it's lightweight how does that work yeah so basically you want with app clips you want like a single feature of your app like you you won't have like a tab bar with like all the different sections of your app it will be more like a, a single flow right like um for us uh it's we're using it for the loyalty cards so it will be like how to get a stamp at the coffee shop and eventually maybe like redeem your free coffee so it will be like those two flows okay um so there's no mm -hmm. like in my case i did like i don't have like i pretty much took the f the full app that i have uh, and I redid the navigation to remove the tab bar and only include the screens that I'm using. So it's actually uh, it's actually pretty easy to do with uh, React Native because you, you you'll have um, I can reuse all my JavaScript code like it's in, it's a, the same project, but the only thing is I have two uh, index files, and then they require different navigation uh, configurations, I guess. And then the, the the one for the app clip only includes the screens that I need. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, I can reuse the same screens um, that I use in the app. So the flow for using uh, for getting a stamp in the app is the same as the one that's used in the app clip. So it's the same code. You can do okay, some yeah, small, small tweaks. What I do is I set a global variable like is app clip 
at the start mm-hmm. of my app clip. So then I can check anywhere. Like, let's say I don't want to show like a, a button or something in the app clip because this feature is not supported. I can check this global variable and just like skip this code. Mm. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is how much code can you reuse? But it sounds like a lot. Yeah, I end up using like I haven't like the I haven't customized the flow that much, but I ended up reusing, reusing most of the code except navigation, where I I um I made like a specific um navigation um stack or whatever for the app clip, uh, but for the actual screens, like the UI is basically the same in both, so I can reuse all all this code and all the like uh, stuff for like network requests. Um, all the like logging infrastructure and everything is is the same, so I was able to reuse uh, most of it. So it almost sounds like a stripped down version of the original app. Yeah, exactly. That was actually the challenge because uh, Apple recommends. I don't know if it's a hard limit or not. Like I haven't uh, tried to publish an app that's bigger than the limit, but they they say they recommend that it's it stays under ten megabytes. Oh, okay. Mm. So. Um, for a, net, a native app, that's kind of a challenge. <laughs> um, I had like the initial version that I I made. I think was like twelve megabytes or something. So what I ended up doing is I removed as much like native dependencies as I could. Uh, like I was one 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 na- native dependency that I noticed that was really big was the Facebook SDK. Mm-hmm. So I ended up removing it and using just like um, uh, I think it's a library called uh, in that browser or something to to do mm. like uh, a web based OAuth flow for Facebook login instead, because uh, like f- the Facebook SDK would like include like uh, st- like a big like two hundred megabyte uh, not megabyte kilobytes of strings for like all the different languages for like their share with Facebook buttons. So they had a bunch of stuff. It wasn't really necessary just for the Facebook login. Also, they include like all the share stuff. Like the, the SDK is actually pretty big, so that saved like at least one megabyte. Um, actually, there's a, another project that I worked on um, that's really cool because I noticed the way assets are bundled uh, currently with React Native, they don't take advantage of uh, a thing called app thinning, where the app is like recompiled when you upload it to the store for each device. So let's say you have like an iPhone X, um, which has like let's it's, it has like a time X, like two times the pixel density or whatever. So it will only include the right assets for the specific device instead of including like all the assets for the, all the different types of devices. Mm. But the way React Native bundles assets currently, it, it doesn't support this because they're just copied in the um, app pretty much. Instead mm. of using, if you're doing like regular um, iOS development, you'll use uh, asset catalogs where you add right. your assets in like a, a, f- a format and you, you tell like um, Xcode, uh, this is the times one, times two, times three assets, and then it kind of adds some. It adds some like metadata to it to know um, which assets are what. And it actually, um, when you compile your app, it will compile all the assets together into a single file, a single binary file that compiles that compresses really well. So there's a bunch of optimizations that actually that um, iOS does. Well, not iOS, mm-hmm. but Xcode does. Um, that uh, React Native apps didn't really get the benefits of. So I, I worked on uh, using assets catalogs instead of um, just copying the, the files directly in the bundle. So that's a PR right now. I'm deploying this to production like soon. Uh, so far it works really well. Um, and that will save like a little bit of space too. That's a PR to React Native Core? Yeah, it's a PR to React okay. Native Core and uh, the CLI also. It's like it might take a while to merge because this kind of stuff is like um, it's a bit hard to land sometimes because yeah. it's a it's a pretty substantial change, uh, mm-hmm. and also Facebook has a lot of like um, like internal stuff that you don't know about. So sometimes it mm-hmm. breaks their their setup. So mm-hmm. I need to find someone at Facebook pretty much to like um, champion it. champion the project. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're interested in trying it out uh, at Infinite Red or something, let me know. That, That'd be that's interesting. That's interesting. I didn't actually know that that didn't work. We've been using like 1x, 2x, 3x assets, and I didn't realize that that wasn't actually uh, doing anything. Well, it's, it, it's, it, it will use the right asset, but 
they will all be included in the final app. So you'll oh, be sending like more data, but hmm. like the, the app actually uses the right asset at least. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it's just that, uh, yeah, you're you're sending more um, data to the user when they download the app versus what they gotcha. Can. I also know. Yeah, that makes sense. Another thing I notice uh, is this: like, a, it was a pretty good performance improvement because um, what happens is since um, Xcode compiles all the assets into a single file, you'll have a lot of less you, you'll have a lot less um, disk I/O for reading files since it will only load the like one big mm-hmm. uh, asset catalog thing. Um, so I noticed, like, I, I did a little like perf, perf benchmark for fun. Like, it, it wasn't really scientific or anything, but like, I could see a lot of times, like, the first time an image would load um, with the old system, it will it would like hit the disk, so it would take like pretty much like ten times the the normal time for loading from uh, memory. It's 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 really small number, like it's like not even a millisecond, but still, um, if you have a large amount of different images, it could make like a it could save like maybe like a few milliseconds there and there. So it's kind of interesting because these app clips uh, may actually, because of the limitations on on app size, might help kind of push people toward optimizing the size of even just regular apps in React Native, like this PR. So this is really exciting to hear. So when this lands, would we have to like once we upgrade to whatever version includes your change? Would we have to put our assets somewhere else? Would we have to treat them differently? Or does it just kind of just take them and do the right thing? The goal is to be as smooth as possible to migrate. So it doesn't require really anything. Um, you will have to like upgrade your project slightly. Um, but it's all involved automatically at build phase. It will add the assets to the catalog and everything. So you just have to like um, update your project. Um, so, so basically, the normal thing you would do when you upgrade React Native, right? So we basically just have to add uh, a new asset catalog file to the project. And then when you build, it will add the images to the catalog automatically. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to like change your code or like have like a different process for managing images. It's really just um, a small update to the project structure. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. I'm excited for that. I'll link to the PR in our show notes as well, so people can take a look at it. So is this something we can do for Expo apps as well? Or is this just React Native CLI? This one is for, I implemented it for the React Native CLI. So right now it won't work with Expo apps, but uh, if Expo wants to do the same thing with their bundling process, because they they have their own way of like including assets, um, they can. I mean, I know the people at Expo pretty well, so I, I actually talked with uh, one of their engineers um, to make sure it wouldn't affect uh, over-the-air updates because that was one of my concerns. I was like, if I change the way assets are bundled, would it like affect how like um, over-the-air updates mm-hmm. work? Um, but for Expo updates, uh, it wouldn't because they they don't like change the original assets at all. They just download the new assets in a separate location and they load that if it exists. Otherwise, they fall back on loading the asset that's uh, that has been bundled with the app. So uh, for that, it should work still. But if they make the changes, the changes aren't that big. So it's just a matter of com- of copying the assets uh, inside of the asset catalog instead of copying it in the final app. Okay. That's really interesting. I also had a question around, not so much around um, app clip, but more around React Native safe area context. And I wanted to know what uh, motivated you to create it. Uh, what was wrong with the previous uh, solution and way of doing things? Okay, so basically, I created this library for Brent from Expo uh, for mm-hmm. because, because he needed it for React navigation. So there's like, especially, well, first, maybe I can explain a little bit what the library does. But basically, safe areas are um, like the, the the areas on your phone that are not safe to display content in. So like notches, mm-hmm. uh, navigation bar, status bar, all this stuff. Um, so the goal is to know the di- dimension of those things, especially now with like all the different types of phones, uh, rounded corners, uh, notches, that those things didn't really exist before. It was, it was all fun when we had all like uh, rectangle screens, but it's not the case anymore. So now we have to think about this. Um, basically React Native shipped a view, uh, a, a view called safe area view 
uh, for a while, but it was iOS only. Uh, so what I did is for for ex actually, at least for uh, React Navigation before they would like hard code like, values for like the the status bar height and all this stuff, but it wasn't really reliable. Now that Android also had devices with notches, so yeah, it was basically to solve this first have support for Android. Yeah. To be able to remove like all these hard coded height from React mm -hmm. Navigation for the base the status bar like where you have like the navigation bar at the top of your app like React Nav React Navigation uh, has to like do this this UI and you have to make sure that you 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 add the right spacing at the top of the the navigation bar. Um, so it was the motivation, yeah. So both platforms give you the native insets, or they both need like they both require native modules or iOS and Android. Yeah, both okay. iOS and Android have a native API for those. Okay. Um, iOS has it since they introduced the iPhone X, which was the first phone with like the notch. Uh, I think it's like iOS 11, maybe, or something. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then on Android, they have an API. They have like two or three different APIs, actually. <laughs> um, on Android, it's a little bit more uh, complex, I guess, the implementation. Uh, they added notches later. So they had an API before for like, I don't remember what, how it's called, but they have an API for that. Uh, and then they also added a different API to get the size of notches. Uh, we actually don't even use it because the first API that they introduced also support notches, so it's fine. We don't need to like use both. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the code is like, it's on Android it's really hard. Like I get often get issues about like, I have this weird phone, and then it like it doesn't work in some cases. Like I'm I'm having a little bit of uh, a struggle with those. It's not that bad, but still, there's still even even though it's better, there's still some issues on certain phones. And like sometimes there's mm -hmm. also different like modes on Android. Like you have like the full screen mode or something, the immersive mode. There's like a million mode that I've never heard of. I also got an issue <laughs> about Android Auto recently, which I never used before. I didn't even know it existed. So um, someone who was trying to use my library on on like a car. Um, That's cool. So, <laughs> so wow. um, was it was it Tesla? No, no. Well, well, it, 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 Android actually has their own like uh, car thing. Like, it's like mm -hmm. Android car. Or, I don't remember how it's called, but they have their own car framework. But then the library wouldn't work there. I think. Mm. Um, so <laughs> that that's really interesting, and it actually gives you a view that you can use. Um, it's just called safe area view. It gives uh, safe area insets applied as padding or margin around the outside. Yeah, so basically there's two APIs. It's, it's actually mm -hmm. a lot more flexible also than um, the previous solution in React Native. Uh, mm -hmm. React Native only included safe area view, which always applied the paddings. Uh, right. The library actually started off as, um, that's, that's why the name safe area context. It's actually started mm -hmm. off as a context provider to okay. get the insets in JS with the hook, I think. Well, no, it was before hook, so it probably mm -hmm. had a provider API or something like this before. Um, but now we support hooks, so you can mm -hmm. basically you you will add a, a provider at the top of your app that will there will be a view that that covers the full screen, and then it will tell you uh, when you use the the hook in other components, it will tell you the insets for this view, so the the part that overlaps the the um, like the places where you shouldn't have content, right? So they like the notch. If the notch is overlapping the view, it will tell you the top overlaps for 20 pixels or something. Cool. Um, what's cool is you can also have multiple providers. So let's say you have um, multiple screens. Like one, one, one use case that's really nice is with, um, with the new model style on iOS. I think it's iOS 13 or something, where it doesn't cover the full screen, right? Now, mm -hmm. the, the models on iOS. Um, so, so you want to have like one provider for each screen because if you're inside a model, then you won't have it won't cover the notch, so you shouldn't add spacing for the the uh. offset. So the library handles these case pretty well, or you can just use the safe area view, which handles everything. It will apply padding automatically, or the hook if mm -hmm. you need the values in JS. So it will return right. you the top, bottom, left, or whatever, and then you can do like some calculation for some reason. Sometimes I, I like to um, do a like um, I guess a max. So I on on like a device that doesn't have a notch, I want like eight pixels of padding. But mm -hmm. if it has mm -hmm. a notch, I want 
uh, I want to go all the way to the notch size. So I'll do like a max between like eight and the notch size. So that if there's no notch, then it will have a small padding. And if there's a notch, it will use the, the notch padding. So you can add some logic in JS also if you're using uh, the hook API, which is nice. Cool. So this has a native, <clears throat> native component for both uh, iOS and Android. Is that because you are there are actual native APIs that will t- tell you all this information? Yeah, exactly. Um, basically, the the native APIs on iOS, mm-hmm. there's like a prop on views that will tell you the safe area insets for this particular view. So depending on where the view is on the screen, um, it will tell you where if it covers the 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 notch or stuff. Um, and on Android, is, there's also a similar API where you can get the insets. And we also have to support older SDKs where we kind of emulate the safe area with other APIs. So there's actually a, quite a bit of native code that we're using. So there's no like art coded value really of like, we don't assume that the device has a status bar of 20 pixels or something. We really get the actual value from uh, the native uh, APIs. Yeah. Yeah. I. I... I have noticed a huge, uh, well, actually, I should say I've noticed that dealing with safe area has been less of a pain for me when I used your library versus before. Yeah, totally agree. The, or- the original safe area view was very, like it sort of locked you in and the behavior was unpredictable and it felt like you couldn't really control what it was doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is safe area context has been a much easier experience. I started doing ios development with ios oh i don't even remember uh i i do know though that uh there was only one type of iphone screen and it was it had a very it had a fixed size so you would literally say okay my app is 320 points wide and i need 44 points at the top for my navigation header because you know why would that ever change? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the iOS five or the iPhone five came out, and they they uh, adjusted the the height. They didn't adjust the width; they just adjust adjusted the height. And it was like, oh no, now we have to actually pay attention to the height of of this app. Um, but you know, I had dealt with bra- browsers before with different sizes and things like that. So this felt like it was super like building apps on easy mode because you know if you just always had one specific. And nobody ever built for Android. So you, know, you just build iOS <laughs> apps for a very specific size. Um, just different times now. Well, people people are using it in cars now, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So I noticed that while I was looking at your third wave GitHub, I noticed you also authored the React Native keyboard aware scroll view. I actually used that recently. Um, really want to thank you for that because I had a lot of issues with like the keyboard scrolling. Like there we had like a whole bunch of text inputs inside a scroll view and it just was driving me nuts. And I found this um, library. Do you still support this or are you kind actually, of I done with it, it? I think it's just a fork actually. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. I, I don't want to take credit for it. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, I, I see a comment uh, from you. <laughs> I, I, well, I, pr- I probably committed something. Like I, I usually for- I fork a lot of libraries and do small changes. Okay. And, uh, probably fix something. Usually, I try to upstream my changes, but maybe in this mm-hmm. case, I didn't. I don't know. Or maybe okay. I just left it as as it. It looks like it came from. I have a lot of forks. A. It looks like a company out of Spain. APSL. Thank you, APSL, and thanks for those comments too. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely a big headache dealing with like the scroll mm-hmm. view issues. There's all these little utilities and people kind of working in obscurity, making them. There's not a lot of, I mean, I I maintain the React Native Web View, and that's like one of the bigger sort of third party systems out there. It, it is not a particularly uh, fun. A uh, thing to work on. It's like its own whole thing. It's way it's way more work than all of our other open source combined. Wow. Uh, just WebView by itself, and it's also the thing that people pretty much only notice when it annoys them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you mean people aren't filing issues saying how amazing it is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not too many now. Yeah, I've gotten one of those at least. It's it's cool. I mean, it's cool. Why not? 
it's a, it's actually kind of the same way with Safaria now. Like it was a fun thing to develop at the start, but now it's kind of in maintenance mode more. So I feel like I'm most spending most of my time like answering issues, trying to find some deep weird mm -hmm. bug on weird devices. Um, I mean, it's 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 a different kind of like um, it's different work definitely when you're like developing a new library and getting started versus yeah. like maintaining it and making sure you're not breaking things for other people uh while trying to fix the problems that some mm -hmm. other people have i have a philosophy around that janique uh because i've been doing open source for a long time like you and my philosophy is i'm going to make it work really well for my use case and then i'm going to try to review pull requests in a time timely manner for p other people's use cases i am not going to investigate their problems for free. <laughs> they can pay me to do that. That's fine. But I'm not going to do it for free. And so that's been a pretty freeing thing for me because it's like, um, I built this, you know, for this use case and it's not working for this other use case. Awesome. It's open source. Please create a pull request. I'll review it. I'll, you know, I am volunteering some of my time to help, mm -hmm. but it's more in terms of reviewing it, testing it, making sure it works before I merge it back in. It's not, I, I'm not gonna like you know really dive deep dive in and and try to figure it out. That took a big load off because when I felt like I had to solve other people's problems all the time, you know, you're just working for free a lot, and it just becomes a, a recipe for burnout. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest parts of our current open source culture. Yeah, is there's not quite enough contributing, and there's a lot of just using mm -hmm. and demanding perfection. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I I always noticed a lot of I feel like a lot of people are scared of like their node modules folder. It's a thing I've mm. always been curious about. I don't know, but like I feel like sometimes people have a problem in their dependencies and they're like, oh, I can't touch this. Like, uh, go open an issue on GitHub. But like sometimes it's really not that like bad to like just go deep into your node modules, just check, log something. I don't know, just have a quick look at the code. Sometimes the problem isn't like super uh, like hard to like figure out. You can just add logs in your node module. It's what's great about JavaScript versus like other like compiled languages. You have the source right there, so you can check. You can like um, open your project in Xcode or something. Add the breakpoint. I uh, said so try to figure out like at least try a little bit. Like I'm not saying that um, it's always easy. Sometimes it's like really 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 hard. But yeah. uh, I feel like just. Don't be afraid of your node modules or like your dependencies. Like it's actually like just people like you and me and everyone that's like that contributes like uh, mm -hmm. these libraries. Like mm -hmm. that's yeah. that's kind of for me at least. Like it was it was always something that I liked and I it really helped me uh, become like a better engineer. I guess uh, not being afraid to like dive deep into like the the issues that are not necessarily my code but other people's code. We've talked about patch package before on this podcast, but I think this is a good shout out for that. You can play around in your node modules folder, but then if you want to persist those changes, if maybe they haven't been merged upstream or something, you can just create a patch and apply it with patch package. And then it applies at any time you run yarn, um, which is very cool. But I totally agree, Janik. That's a, I actually did it just a couple days ago. I dove into my node modules, found an issue that was like, causing some pain for me edited just right in the source there and just tested to make sure it worked and then submitted a pr up upstream now the offending code happened to be mine <laughs> upstream <laughs> but in this case it was it was kind of a similar thing there is something i want to ask um uh what is the, is there something that you know about uh in react native uh, core maybe that is less known by the public that you think is worth mentioning so whether it's a component or because i know that you've made me discover a few things that were not really documented in the past so hmm. what were some of those things here uh so you showed me the not uh pressable it's like bounceable mm -hmm. or something uh, it was like this oh yeah the touchable <laughs> bounce touchable bounce in. i've no, never heard of that <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not never even right. exported from react native <laughs> okay. it's just there so you have to 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 import it from the full path inside yeah. react native uh but it works yeah. well it's a it's a yeah it's like, i used it it's, yeah it, it's a cool component yeah. but you, you really have to know the the react native source and like what does it do it's like the, well you know when you press a button and like it bounces 
It's like this kind of feedback for touchable. It's like a touchable with this bounce feedback, like spring type. Yeah, it's oh, okay. it's actually quite nice. It's there, but it's not documented. And Janique told me about it, and I literally used it for Uplet, my previous startup. And it's still that's still the code that's there. It's using this touchable bounce component. I'm going to publish a library that says that it has it's like React Native button bounce, and then all it does is reach in and export <laughs> React. <laughs> <laughs> There might be one already that does that. I don't yeah, know. Some, yeah. <laughs> or someone just copied the code because if you want to be safe right. to make sure like Facebook doesn't break it because they decide to change the, where the file is. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. But yeah, I don't mind using these internals API because anyway, I keep my my React Native pre pre up to date and I don't mind like playing around with this yeah. stuff. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's one of those. There's this. I don't know if there's other stuff that I can think of. Think of. There's uh, one little unknown module. Um, that I actually worked on. Uh, it's called like dev menu, where you can add buttons, like custom buttons from JS in the dev menu. So let's say like my app has like a secret uh, dev screen where you have like some information about like, I don't know which API I'm using. Uh, it also, I added also like um, code to like navigate to any screen, pretty much like, I guess stuff you'd have, you have this with uh, React to Tron, right? It's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit like a mini Reactotron inside my app um, <laughs> that I built for fun. Um, That's fun. But you can like add like to the when you open the dev menu from React Native, I, I added a button there where it's like dev screen or whatever. So there's an API for that. I think it's called like dev menu or something like this. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I didn't. So know you can that. you could add you can add like any button that you want from on the the menu. So if there's like dev actions that you need to add to your app, you can. You can check it out. I'll that's try to find it. Genius. That. Yeah, I think that, that, that's cool. I didn't know about that. I think what what's cool is uh, whenever I see uh, Janik work, he's always running his own build of, of React Native. <laughs> like hmm. he, 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 you know, so uh, that's really cool way to discover these things. Uh, yeah. And I actually started uh, doing that after a while, except uh, uh, running it on the Android version was really hard. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm using my own fork. Of React Native in my apps because I, I usually do like um, I usually have changes that I I want to make uh, and I don't want to wait until my PR is merged. So mm -hmm. and also I have a I don't think I have really I have a couple of changes actually that I have I won't upstream because they're like not good enough to be upstream. Like I, I use a different image mm -hmm. implementation um, that's that I made quickly that's not really upstreamable because uh, Facebook won't, won't like change mm -hmm. the, the image implementation mm -hmm. anyway um, on iOS. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm also building from source on Android. So I think that makes it a lot easier to work uh, with Android when you build for, from source because you can actually change the code. Like I said before, like what's kind of not bad, but like what's annoying about uh, if you're using just React Native normally on Android is that it uses pre-compiled um, jars which is great for build speed like i'm always amazed mm -hmm. by how fast it builds on android uh when i use like a, another app um mm -hmm. because it uses the pre-compiled react native um but if you're building from source it builds really slow but you can make changes in the actual react native core code mm -hmm. oh interesting um so yeah, that's cool uh anyways yeah. you, if you're using a fork you kind of have to uh build from source anyway um yeah but that's something I've been using. You you like living on the edge a little bit. You know, there's there's <laughs> actually some value in that though. Like exposing yourself to some pain um, kind of forces you to learn. You know, once you hit those points, you got to go in there and dig in and figure out. And it just gives you this much better mental map of what's happening under the hood in the tools that you use. I I, I get that for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think I think actually like. It, 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 maybe it sounds like it's living on the edge, but like React Native is insanely stable. Like mm -hmm. Facebook lives on the edge of React Native, so right. th they run master all the time. So <laughs> um, like I've yeah. have had my own the, the issues that I have that I have are usually more like related to like the open source version of React Native. Well, not it's, there's no there's no open source version, but like op the the open source projects are structured slightly differently, and sometimes bugs would happen uh, if you're using React Native uh, from outside Facebook versus mm -hmm. how they use it internally. Um, yeah. 
like I just want to make it clear there's no like two versions of React Native. Like Facebook uses exactly the same code. That's uh that's on the repo. It's just um they have some internal modules. I think they use a different CLI though for like building the app and everything. Like they don't use yeah. the community CLI. There's there's some differences there, but uh there's no like Facebook version. I know some some people will say uh We'll say like the Facebook use, runs a different version of React Native, but they they don't. Right. They, they they have some experiments, I guess, that are open source. But yeah. I don't yeah. want to be quoted out of context. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just curious: Are there any like contribution docs or or something that actually explains how to run React Native from source? If people want to try that, yeah, there is. Um, I can send you the link. I guess. Okay, we can include it in the show notes. That'd be awesome. Because I, I think that might be a, an interesting thing to try. Yeah. Yeah. Just to get a better understanding and like tweak things mm-hmm. in the source code and see what changes. Yeah. And... Yeah. I've never I've never thought about doing it that way. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. The the main thing is you need to have the um, Android NDK installed because there's a lot of C plus plus code that needs to be compiled. Um, that's the native development kit. Yeah. Right? NDK. Yeah. That there's the SDK and then there's the NDK. But right now it's pretty easy to install also because you can install it right from uh, Android Studio now. Before you had to like mm. download it somewhere, get a link, get the right version. Now you can just <laughs> get the latest version on um, with Android Studio and it usually works pretty well. And okay, there's a, yeah, there's a guide somewhere. Perfect. Very cool. I I think we could keep asking you questions all day, Janique, uh, but we're kind of getting to the end of this episode. So we might have to have you on uh, in the future sometime to to do some follow up questions. But so let's go into the next part of our podcast, which is weird bugs. This is the part of the podcast where we talk about weird bugs that we have either encountered ourselves or we have seen other people encounter on our team, and we just share them with everybody. So who has a weird bug? Anybody have a good weird bug story here? So if nobody else does, uh, I can go. So a few days ago, Kevin, who works on our team, posted just a little heads up in our engineering channel. This isn't really a weird bug, but it's a gotcha that you should really pay attention to if you are working in React Web or React Native. He was saying uh, that yesterday and the day before, I was fighting a mysterious undefined prevdeps.length error. It came with a warning that suggested checking the rules of hooks, but best I could tell, I wasn't violating any of the rules. But uh, so it turned out that he was actually violating the rule against changing the order of hooks because he actually had an early return before one of his hooks. So when the early return would trigger, it wouldn't actually have the hook that was being uh, defined after the early return. So you have to make sure if you have hooks in a component that they all happen before any sort of um, conditional logic that might change the order or the number of hooks. And React is very good about picking up on this and saying, hey, you have a problem here. The In this case, the error wasn't very helpful. <laughs> but um, essentially, uh, yeah, you have to make sure that if you are returning from a function, you know, a function component, or you are, you have like an if statement or something like that, that it doesn't affect your hooks. You always want to define all yeah. of those up front. It has to basically render the same amount of hooks, right? Yes. If you want to be able to do it after an early return, you have to do it in like a sub component. You actually have to move that hook into a sub component and then, then it's okay. So that's something to keep an eye out for. I know a lot of people have used hooks probably kind of know this rule a little bit, but uh, just just keep an eye out for it if you have an early return that does count as a conditional. That makes sense. That's a good tip. Is the, because um, I know there's a ESLint plugin for like rules of hooks. It, yeah. Does it not detect early returns? I don't know if it would, could have been possible to spot it with a, a linter. I did not yeah. ask. Kevin. I feel like a linter wouldn't pick up on that because maybe it, it's not smart you have enough to run it. To, to, yeah, to it's hard to say. I, I do know that there is that linter and it it has caught things in yeah. the past. I don't know if Kevin is using the linter rule or not. Uh, that that's a very good question. We'll link to that to that linter uh, rule as well in the show notes. So yeah. That'd be great if it could de- if it could detect early returns. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those gotchas that 
you know, hooks are amazing and they have this really kind of cool feeling, but you do have to know quite a few sort of just just kind of rules rule, rules of thumb around them because of how they're implemented. You can't just use them sort of willy nilly. Yeah, I've I've had a few like the, the worst are like this tail closure bugs where you oh, have yeah. like like I've I've had like one or two of those. I try to avoid as much as possible. Like, um, but sometimes it it, it happened a few times where I was like, oh, that's the the bug that everyone talks about. Like the like tail. <laughs> you you you'd see like an old version of your variable somewhere somehow because yeah. you have like uh like wrong dependencies or something. I think in the hook. I don't yeah. remember the exactly what the bug yeah. was, but uh. Like it, it was the bug that everyone was talking about. That's like, oh, that's one of the gutches of hook, and actually hit yeah. it a couple of time. We do still use hooks in our in our apps, but there uh, there's a lot of this that we kind of avoid by using Mobx State Tree and Mobx React Lite. It kind of gets around having to think about those rules as much. There are rules with that too, but they're just they're probably a little simple. Yeah, I think like uh, Julian. So Julian is one of the engineers that Infinite Red uh, mentioned that. Something about passing an observable array as a dependency. I think there was maybe like yeah. a, an issue there. So you, yeah, yeah, totally. Yep. You have to slice yeah, it. That's that's definitely a so you get a, definitely a gotcha there as yeah. well. Although that had to do with that had to do with an interplay between a gotcha of Mobx state tree and a gotcha of of, hooks, yeah. of React yeah. hooks. <laughs> so the the two inter interplayed there a bit. Cool. Thanks so much, Janique. It was awesome to have you on, dropping some of your immense knowledge here on our podcast. I'm, yeah, it's 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 been been a lot of fun, and I like I said, there are many more questions that we didn't get to. I had a bunch of Robin notes that I could have uh, asked those <laughs> questions on. Uh, sorry about that, Robin. But uh, but really appreciate you coming on today, and uh, very much looking forward to having you on in the future sometime. Where can where can someone find you on Twitter, Jenny? Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, of course, if if you want to hear me again, I'll I'll have some fun to come again. Um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. You can follow me on Twitter at uh, Janik Duplessis, like my full name. Maybe you can link it somewhere because it's not super obvious how it's spelled. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in the show notes. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So f- basically, follow me on Twitter. That's pretty much where I post stuff once in a while. Perfect. Or check out my GitHub, I guess. You should also check out my app, Third Wave. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe you can add a link to that too. Uh, yeah, just, we will. Like, I think it's a cool, even if you're not like using or you're not uh, into coffee, it's, I think it's a cool example of a good like React Native app. Like, For sure. That you can yeah. like, I, I've, I've had comments about people that were like, oh, I didn't know your app was made in React Native because like, I think it's pretty much as good as like a, a native, native app. So um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's always good to get examples of a really nice production React Native totally. apps. No, I'm also open also to like sharing stuff if you're like, I know I've shared a lot of stuff with Aris before when he was working on uh, Uplet. Yeah. So like if there's something in my app that you like and you're like, oh, how, how do you make this? Uh, I'll, I like uh, sharing knowledge about what I what I work on. Very cool. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm going to second that. Third Wave uh, is like the... I, I think I even ran your custom <laughs> React Native build once, but uh, yeah, it's a really good example of a, a really smooth React Native app. I actually still like I often look at it just to like uh, inspire myself. Then I bug Jenny and I'm like, "How did you do that?" Or like e- even the images. <laughs> if you actually try Third Wave on a web, and Jenny can explain mm-hmm. it way better than me, but uh, it uses Gatsby, and I believe you use the same image component, right? Wow. So yeah, I yeah. That, that, I guess that's that, that could be a subject for another yeah, time. For but sure. I, I've mm-hmm. built I've built a like um kind of design system component library where I can reuse a lot of code um, and use the same abstractions on the web and on uh, React Native. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again. And of course, people can find us online. You can find uh, our Twitter at React Native R D I O. We were one letter short, constrained, so we had to drop the A there. You can find Harris at Brunostman, yep. B-R-N, B-R-U-N-O-S-T-M-A-N-N. Yep. Aditi at Aditi Ravi, A-D-H-I-T-H-I-R-A-V-I. Mm-hmm. And Robin at Robin underscore Heinz with an E on Twitter. And then you can find me at Jamin Holmgren, just first and last name. 
and hit us up if you uh, like this episode, if you have any ideas for future episodes, and if you have any questions, of course, feel free to tag us on that. Really appreciate everybody coming along. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.